But besides those two obvious centralization hubs, the often overlooked sources of power are the largest stablecoin custodians. They have basically enough power at this point to dictate which Ethereum blockchain is valid in the event of a hard fork. Welcome back to Ethereum Audible. I'm Yeshua Zlatogorsky, and this is where we read the best in the Web3 Ethereum ecosystem. Last week, we dove into part one of Lynn Alden's Proof of Stake, the stablecoin centralization problem, and this week we're going to continue with part two. But first, I want to thank the sponsors of the show who made this episode possible. This episode is brought to you by Alp Audio. Want to learn on the go but need more depth than a podcast? Alp is the app for you. It's an audio education app that brings great in-depth courses that are as fun as podcasts but as educational as a degree. Each lesson comes with summaries, additional resources, flashcards, and more. You can even find Ethereum Audible on Alp with all of those additional resources. If you want to check it out, head over to get.alpaudio.com, and that's A-L-P-E, Alp, A-L-P-E. So without further ado, let's go. Part two of Lynn Alden's Proof of Stake and the Stablecoin Centralization Problem. We are starting smack in the middle, the Stablecoin Centralization Problem. Stablecoin custodians represent another attack vector and centralization problem against smart contract platforms that have DeFi as a key part of their ecosystem, whether they are proof of work or proof of stake. This problem affects protocols like Ethereum and Solana, but not really Bitcoin. The summary of this chapter for those that want to skim parts of this otherwise very long article is that any smart contract blockchain that relies heavily on DeFi for its use case can have the outcome of its hard forks significantly determined by centralized stablecoin custodians. These custodians can nullify the value of all stablecoins on whichever side of the fork they don't view as the correct one, which severely reduces the survivability of that side of the blockchain by rendering its DeFi mostly insolvent. This can include picking the fork chain over the original chain, and therefore all variables of the blockchain are potentially mutable even if the node network doesn't like the changes. Stablecoins are tokens on a blockchain that represent units of fiat currency, and most commonly the US dollar. Now that smart contract blockchains exist, they can be used for various purposes. One popular pur purpose is that an entity collects dollars and then issues tokens on a smart contract blockchain that represent redeemable claims on those dollars. And these tokens are called stablecoins because they are stable against that dollar and are ostensibly backed one for one by dollars and dollar equivalents, although that last part has historically been quite controversial, since that's not always the case. Once stablecoins are issued, people can use whichever blockchain they are issued on to send and receive stablecoin payments between themselves with no centralized third party. From a user standpoint, stablecoins are a significant technological leap over existing bank payment systems, especially for international payments of any size or large domestic payments. You can send someone a million dollars on another continent at 2 a.m. on a Sunday night, and they can receive it in minutes, and you can verify the transaction on the blockchain. And that, by the way, is part of why governments are not particularly thrilled with their existence and are working on regulations to get them increasingly surveyed and censorable. These types of stablecoins are, of course, quite centralized. The custodian holds the actual money, the collateral that backs all of those tokens. The custodians have the power to blacklist some of their tokens, which freezes them and basically makes them worthless. Tether has blacklisted over 500 addresses and counting. At the end of the day, the custodians determine which of their token liabilities meet their criteria to be redeemable, or even to be sent among peers. If you do something they or their governments don't like, or your tokens are on the wrong side of a hard fork of what the stablecoin issuer believes the preferred side of the fork to be on, your money might not be worth anything anymore. There is now over $140 billion in stablecoin value on smart contract networks. This gives them tremendous power over the networks. To explore why, let's review the concept of a blockchain hard fork. Hard forks reviewed. 
a blockchain can have something called a hard fork, where developers and miners or validators decide to change the protocol rules and create a new set of blocks that don't conform to the rules of the existing node network. If there is a significant number of miners that agree on these new changes, they can sustain this new blockchain indefinitely. These changes could include major modifications of the money supply, block size, issuance rate, and other foundational rules of the protocol. Meanwhile, if other miners also continue to create blocks that conform to the existing node network, then the singular blockchain splits into two, like a fork in the road. The original blockchain and the new blockchain both continue in parallel. Bitcoin Cash is a well-known example. They significantly increased the block size compared to the original Bitcoin protocol and went in their own direction and subsequently lost a lot of value compared to Bitcoin. Bitcoin Satoshi Vision forked out of Bitcoin Cash and subsequently lost a lot of value compared to Bitcoin as well. The reason that Bitcoin is often called immutable by its proponents is that it is extremely resistant to changes. Once you have a full node, you have the software that recognizes blocks as either being valid or invalid according to the consensus rules of the protocol, such as block size, money supply, etc. If someone makes a hard fork, they basically just make their own blockchain and it doesn't affect yours, and doesn't affect the software consensus that is the Bitcoin network. So far, every hard fork attempt on Bitcoin has been unable to gather the critical mass of users to move over to it. If developers and miners on your blockchain decide to create a soft fork, as in a backward compatible, smaller change that does conform to the rules of the existing node network, but also narrows them, then they can do that and you can operate with a network whether or not you personally decide to upgrade to that new subset of rules that constitutes the soft fork or not. Either way, you're still compatible with the network. This is why in the 2015 to 2017 block size wars, extremely powerful forces could not overcome the power of individual users running their own nodes. The majority of miners, the near monopoly producer of mining equipment at that time, several of the biggest Bitcoin-related exchanges and companies, and some of the influential early adopters all tried to change the Bitcoin network to their preference and were rejected. It's hard to describe how big of a combined assault that was. It was like the movie Avengers Infinity War, where the entire team of Avengers, including Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, Captain America, Black Widow, Black Panther, Spider-Man, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Scarlet Witch, Vision, and Doctor Strange teamed up against Thanos and still lost against Thanos. Thanos was inevitable in that movie. Likewise, Bitcoin was immutable thanks to its user-led node network, and it proved it in the field in 2017. It doesn't mean it would resist every challenge, but with this event, it has withstood a far bigger challenge to its decentralization model in the field than any other cryptocurrency. Before and after failing to change the Bitcoin network, many of those people created numerous hard forks of Bitcoin, with the most well-known one being Bitcoin Cash. When a hard fork happens, each user keeps their existing coins, and that network continues to run without acknowledging the existence of the hard fork, since those blocks don't conform to the rules of the network, and also gets the new coins. So when Bitcoin Cash split from Bitcoin, if a user originally had 10 Bitcoins, she now had 10 Bitcoins and 10 Bitcoin Cash coins. She could keep both sets of coins, or she could sell the set of coins that she didn't want, assuming they're worth anything with real buyers, and buy more of the ones she wants. Users mostly chose to sell the Bitcoin Cash coins in that instance, and so Bitcoin Cash lost tremendous value compared to Bitcoins. In addition, the Bitcoin Cash network had far fewer miners, and thus was less secure against 51% attacks. The divide has only grown since then. If just 1-2% to 2 of miners from the Bitcoin network decided to attack the Bitcoin Cash network and overwhelm its hash power today, they can do so. What we know as Bitcoin, or BTC, is the blockchain that has not undergone any formal hard forks. It's compatible with nodes that go back many, many years. Bitcoin Cash, BCH, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, BSV, and other blockchains are the ones that are hard forks meaning they split and were not recognized as Bitcoins by the existing node network, but instead became their own thing. Ethereum is different in this regard. What we know as Ethereum, or ETH, today is a hard fork of a hard fork of a hard fork of a hard fork of a hard fork. 
it purposely updates via hard forks. In fact, the minor altcoin ghost chain known as Ethereum Classic, or ECH, is the original Ethereum block, at least out of the Ethereum blockchains that still exist. In Ethereum's early days, a massive flawed smart contract was exploited due to poorly written code, and rather than lay it play out as coded with investors losing money in their failed project, developers rolled back the entire blockchain with a hard fork. And due to a broad community support, that hard fork became the dominant chain. The original blockchain where that change was not rolled back, mostly abandoned, became Ethereum Classic. Since then, Ethereum has continued to hard fork a number of times to make updates. But those other chains that it forks from get abandoned without a name, since they are not as contested by anyone with significant resources like the Ethereum Classic chain was. Since Ethereum updates via hard forks and has difficulty bombs inserted into its code on the existing pre-fork chain, it gives developers a lot more control over the direction of the network than nodes. The Ethereum node network doesn't realistically have the power to reject changes in the way that Bitcoin network nodes do. Since a hard fork moves beyond their existing nodes anyway, and there are difficulty time bombs in Ethereum's code. This gets users and miners to regularly agree to switch to new hard forks that developers come to consensus on. In fact, Ethereum experienced an unintended chain split in November of 2020 due to an update bug, and then another unintended chain split in August 21 due to an update bug. Bitcoin proponents often criticize Ethereum's level of centralization and ease of mutability. Ethereum proponents often defend it as necessary to change it into something better to update faster. It's a different set of philosophies, but it's impossible to realize how different those philosophies are in the technical sense. Stablecoin custodians, smart contract fork deciders. Apart from difficulty bombs and things like that, there are powerful centralized forces in Ethereum that can dictate which hard fork is successful if a hard fork occurs. Seeing as how both intentional and unintentional hard forks happen with Ethereum quite often, that's a relevant fact. The Ethereum Foundation remains a powerful force for determining the direction of Ethereum. Consensus, which contributes to development and runs the Infura node infrastructure, which if it goes down basically brings down a large portion of Ethereum functionality, as it did in November 2020 to, to the chain split, and owns MetaMask, the key wallet application used by tens of millions of Ethereum users for DeFi apps and NFTs, is another powerful influence over the direction of the network. But besides those two obvious centralization hubs, the often overlooked sources of power are the largest stablecoin custodians. They have basically enough power at this point to dictate which Ethereum blockchain is valid in the event of a hard fork. With $150 billion in assets between them, the two largest stablecoins have a lot of influence over Ethereum and other smart contract blockchains. When a hard fork happens, stablecoin custodians cannot recognize both sets of tokens as redeemable for their money, since there are now twice as many total tokens, two full sets, one for each fork of the blockchain. They have to pick which blockchain is the valid one in their eyes, for which they accept redemption of their tokens for money, and whichever one they don't recognize as valid has its DeFi and other stablecoin value eradicated. Most of the $100 billion in assets under management locked up in DeFi protocols, the core lifeblood of Ethereum is reliant on centralized stablecoins, as well as the stablecoins that are used by centralized offshore exchanges or that are being used for payments. So Ethereum users can't necessarily fall back on their node network defense if developers and large entities want to change any of the rules of the underlying protocol, including money supply or any other variable. If a hard fork happens and some large entities and stablecoin custodians acknowledge this new fork as the new main blockchain, then it doesn't really matter what the existing nodes think. Their existing chain will almost certainly lose with broken stablecoins and broken DeFi, and the new hard fork with new rules but functional stablecoins and functional DeFi will win. And it's important to note that the stablecoins are known entities and have dealt with legal action in the past. If governments where custodians are located want to crack down on cryptocurrencies, they would have an easy time with smart contract blockchains. 
governments could quickly seize custodian funds, blacklist all stablecoins, and render a large portion of DeFi insolvent across all smart contract platforms. Or they could enforce a hard fork with top companies and stablecoin custodians to create certain rules that the government wants the blockchain to have, like certain surveillance, backdoors, or changes to other variables of the protocol. A blockchain that is as self-contained as possible like the Bitcoin network is inherently more resistant to those types of attacks or centralization of forces. There is no stablecoin provider and there is no key wallet developer that could direct the Bitcoin network in any significant way, especially when it comes to enforcing hard forks. There are some stablecoins that run on layers on top of the Bitcoin network, but they don't run directly on the base layer of the protocol and not in any size that is critical to the ecosystem. That is why I classify Bitcoins as being a form of money, while I classify most other cryptocurrencies as being a type of financial services equity, a more centralized platform with a pre-mine for the development of applications. Smart contract blockchains are semi-centralized to varying degrees, demonstrably mutable, and therefore are political in nature. That doesn't mean they can't go up in price, and doesn't mean they can't offer functionality, but it makes them inherently different things than global immutable monetary assets. And so, it's useful to separate them into these two conceptual buckets. How important is decentralization? In bull markets, and at times with no regulatory crackdowns or drama, technical details don't really matter. Wall Street actually kind of loves DeFi in the tactical sense, because in aggregate they understand the idea of leveraging, liquidity management, exchanging, and arbitraging inefficiencies, and don't really care about decentralization or technical details as much. But for cypherfunks, sound money advocates, those who, are, who care about immutability and money supply assurances over a decade-long investment horizon, and those who care about securities laws, they notice. It's often said that a blockchain is basically just an inefficient database. Users are willing to trade inefficiency to ensure decentralization. A blockchain, especially the truly decentralized variety, is a database that is small and tight enough that thousands or millions of entities around the world can store it on their local devices and constantly update it peer-to-peer -peer using an established set of rules. A fully centralized database has fewer limitations because it doesn't need to be small and tight. A large service provider can have an utterly massive database contained in a server farm. That can make things run very efficiently, but unlike with a blockchain, outside entities can't directly audit it for content and changes and have no control over it. Your social media account is an item in a corporation's database. It can be deleted or chained, and you have no say in this. You have no way to audit what information they hold about you in their database. The same is true for your bank accounts, your criminal records, your health records, any cloud services you use, etc. Corporations and government entities have databases and may at times choose to let you access those databases with limited permissions or not. They are fully centralized, non-auditable, and easily changeable by the organization that runs it. The killer application of a sufficiently decentralized database is money. Money is a ledger at the end of the day, and the more immutable it is, the better, at least for long-term storage. The ability to store value in a public ledger by simply saving or memorizing a number and transfer that value to others internationally wherever you want in a way that millions of other participants recognize and that no centralized entity can change or prevent or debase is quite useful. Smart Contract Layer 1 platform developers propose that there are many more potential applications that benefit from blockchain technology as well, besides just money. That remains an open question among cryptocurrency traders and investors. What are the other applications? Quick payments, like stablecoins, seem to be an answer, and potentially things like settlement of securities, gaming, or etc. The biggest challenge with these proposals is that the more features you add to a blockchain on the base layer, the less small and tight it is, and therefore the less decentralized it tends to be. The question then becomes, are there shades of partial decentralization that people will accept in exchange for more features that the database can offer? 
And can those partially decentralized blockchain survive attacks, disagreements, and other tests over the long term? Here's another way to phrase the question. Since we know that there are use cases for fully centralized databases, like Twitter or AWS, as well as use cases for fully decentralized databases, example, the Bitcoin network, are there use cases for a partially centralized and partially decentralized database? If the answer is yes, then that's basically the steel man argument for the existence of base layer smart contract blockchains like Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, Algorand, and more. This set of hypothetical partially decentralized databases wouldn't conceptually compete with Bitcoin as truly decentralized immutable asset, but could they coexist alongside Bitcoin indefinitely as a semi-open operating system for apps that benefit from partial auditability or partially decentralized control? For example, if a database is controlled to some extent by a central organization, but it is open source and is designed in such a way that its contents can be independently backed up and audited in real time by certain high performance external nodes, does that concept have an addressable market? perhaps for payments and security settlement. And what about a federated database, meaning a database that requires the cooperation of several large organizations to change, or that requires proof of stake by large and generally oligopolistic entities, rather than a singular entity? Could that have long-term value? I don't have the answers to these questions, other than that with the technology that currently exists or that is foreseeable on the horizon as of this writing, they're clearly not suitable for truly decentralized global money in the same way that the Bitcoin network is. They might work for gaming, permission payment systems, trading, and that sort of thing, but time will tell if they can survive past the speculation phase and regulatory arbitrage phase that they are now in. Overall, I view some of them as probably lasting for a long time if regulators allow them to, as information technology or financial service equities that pass the Howey test and are therefore securities. It's also worth noting that smart contracts can exist as layers on top of Bitcoin as layer two solutions. In fact, they already do exist in that form, but those ones aren't the dominant ones. The dominant ones are the versions that currently stand alone as layer one solutions, such as on Ethereum, Solana, and their various competitors. Smart contract applications. So far, decentralized finance, DeFi, and non-fungible tokens, NFTs, are the two popular smart contract applications, aside from just storing and transmitting value, that have gained significant market value on public blockchains. And both of them require additional complexity, and thus tend to cluster on blockchains such as Ethereum and Solana that, as discussed in this article, are more centralized than the Bitcoin network. There is also a third category, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, or DAOs, that have gained a lot of press in recent months, even though they're not on the financial scale of DeFi's or NFT's yet. I'll leave them for another article. DeFi includes decentralized exchanges where users can trade various tokens between themselves and includes decentralized platforms for leveraging tokens, meaning that users can earn yield by lending or pay yield to borrow with collateral. Many of them still have centralized companies running them. For example, Uniswap and Compound are both centralized VC-backed companies. But they do have open source code that sophisticated users can navigate without using the company's interfaces as long as the underlying blockchain is not compromised. And as previously discussed, those underlying blockchains do have centralized attack surfaces, so they are mutable to various degrees. NFTs include things like digital art, unique game items, or digital movie tickets that exist as unique items on a blockchain. Each category has some nuances about how they work. Digital art, for example, doesn't actually exist on the blockchain, but rather there is a pointer on the blockchain that links to where the image is stored elsewhere. It is like owning a signed receipt from the artist of that image. Unique game items can include digital pets or in-game items or in-game land and property, and they can be sold to other players or even removed from the game and potentially accepted by another game that recognizes them. The criticism of these applications so far is that they mainly revolve around speculation. Here is how I described 
DeFi back in January in my 2021 Ethereum article. For example, quote, One of my concerns when reviewing the biggest use case for decentralized apps is that a lot of the use case is circular and speculative. Ethereum is heavily used for decentralized exchanges of crypto tokens, crypto stablecoins that serve as liquid units of account for trading crypto tokens, and lending and earning interest on crypto tokens, which is a practice that serves as a liquidity or borrowing source for trading of crypto tokens. To a lesser extent, it is also used for gamified ways to earn or trade various crypto tokens. So it's a big operating system powered by crypto tokens for the purpose of moving around crypto tokens. A healthy banking system in the real world would consist of people depositing money and the banks making various loans for mortgages and for business financing to generate real world utility. A speculation-based banking system, on the other hand, would consist of a bunch of banks taking deposit money and then lending to speculators in the nearby stock market, along with technology providers that make this easier. And then what those speculators are trading mostly consists of shares of those banks, shares of those tech companies, and shares of the stock exchange, resulting in a big circular speculative party. That's the biggest use case so far for Ethereum is a decentralized version of that circular speculation based system. End quote. And data has shown that since I wrote that, it has become even more like this. According to the large blockchain anal analytics firm Chainalysis, DeFi is almost entirely a trading, leveraging, arbitrage environment for its institutional scale traders and professional whales, with individual retail traders strikingly absent. The same is generally true for NFTs. There has been a large frenzy of speculation around CryptoPunks going up, for example. A key problem is that these types of NFT sets are pretty easy to manipulate because each one has a unique price, making it hard to establish what the real demand is. There are two easy scams that can be done with this asset that can't be done with fungible liquid assets. The first scam is to bid up asset prices and trick buyers into thinking those prices are real and to buy into it. It's market manipulation, in other words. For example, a user can set up five different Ethereum addresses and start trading around an NFT to themselves at increasingly higher prices. Outside observers don't know that all these wallets belong to the same person, and that is literally just insider in trading. This is only possible with a non-fungible asset. You can't manipulate the price of an individual Bitcoin or an individual Ether on your own. You can only manipulate unique objects like, for example, CryptoPunk number 9998. Then, with prices seemingly so high, some people want to get in on the momentum and buy the NFT. So the person who is trading among their own wallets finally sells the asset at a higher price to that unsuspecting newcomer. When that newcomer tries to sell the asset, he or she is unable to find other buyers who actually want to pay that price. They don't realize that a lot of the liquidity and price escalating transactions were actually just manipulation. The second scam is to create a big loss to reduce tax liabilities in a fraudulent way. Again, you create several different wallets, one of them is linked to your real name, and the others are anonymous. You buy an NFT with an anonymous account that you control for $200,000 and sell it to another anonymous account you control for 250 k Then you sell it to your real name account for 500 k Your real name account then sells it to another one of your anonymous accounts for 200 k locking in a massive $300,000 loss. Your anonymous account can then potentially sell it for roughly what you paid for it, maybe $200,000, if the market hasn't changed much since you began this trick. This is a useful tax loss, which wasn't really a loss since you secretly paid it to yourself, that can offset your real crypto capital gains from other trading areas. To be clear, people who don't enjoy spending time in handcuffs shouldn't try these actions. This type of thing happens in traditional art as well, but it can happen orders of magnitude faster in digital form. And that's not to say that all of the liquidity and price action is fraud. I don't know how much is. It's simply that with the technology as it is, it is very difficult to distinguish what percentage is fraud and what percentage is real. And rising price action based on fraud can temporarily bring in real demand liquidity, making the difference between the two rather murky. This is not much of an issue for large cap liquid tokens, but it's potentially a big issue for non-fungible tokens. 
There was an example back in October 2021 where CryptoPunk 998 sold for $532 million. At first glance, this was the highest valued art sale of all time. However, upon further analysis, it turns out that the buyer used a DeFi protocol to sell the asset to their own self with a massive flash loan. They then tried to list it for $1 billion, but of course, nobody wanted to buy it at that price. These are fake prices. So far, the most popular NFT application for retail investors may be Axie Infinity, which is indeed played by millions of people in the Philippines and in many other countries globally, and for which the in-game currency is accepted by some outside merchants. However, the economics of that game are also inherently speculative because the majority of people can only make money if the number of new players continues to grow. A video game naturally runs into competition and a finite scale at some point, at which point the majority of participants would no longer be making money from the game. Now, the argument from advocates in favor of these dedicated smart contract platforms is that it's speculative here in the beginning, but that in time it will mature and be useful for more non-speculative utility related to a shared virtual economy. And I'm sympathetic to that view. After all, Bitcoin investors face similar allegations. In the early days, Bitcoins were frequently used in the dark web, and today many people buy a little bit of Bitcoin as a speculation to start with. And then, as they learn more about it, they start viewing it more like a long-term asset to hold rather than speculate with. Stablecoins. One of the key smart contract applications that I think clearly is useful is stablecoins. From the user perspective, they're generally a better way to handle fiat currency payments than, say, international wire transfers or large domestic payments. You can send payments and clear them in minutes any time of the week. They will naturally face ongoing government regulation and be controlled and surveyed as part of the banking system in many cases, but it seems clear that they have utility for actual payments and will probably get increasingly incorporated into financial systems, either in the form of central bank digital currencies or private but highly regulated stablecoin issuers. This is simply due to automation and superior technology. When you send a wire transfer, the bank has to actively do something to process that transaction, and wires often get delayed or blocked or run into other problems as they flow between banks. From the user's perspective, it's often unclear which bank it got stuck in or who to call, and thus it often takes days to resolve. With stablecoins, it's the opposite. The automatic nature of blockchains allows for peer-to-peer -peer transactions handled by software, including internationally and including with large amounts of money. The custodians are passive in that regard and let the technology work for them and only act in the event that they want to blacklist some of their tokens for some reason that they detected. In other words, regulated stablecoins allow for an automated peer-to-peer -peer payment system, but with an overlay of surveillance and censorship based on know your customer and anti-money laundering, KYC and AML laws. Importantly, however, we see that stablecoins have been rather platform agnostic. Tether, for example, moved from primarily running on a layered solution on Bitcoin called Omni running on Ethereum to increasingly running on Tron. Is Tron a better blockchain than Ethereum? No, it's just cheaper. The less critical an application is, the cheaper people want it to be. In other words, stablecoins as payment solutions tend to optimize for low transaction fees and thus tend to concentrate towards efficient but centralized platforms. And all of the big stablecoins that underpin DeFi rely on centralized custodians anyway. Will banks eventually just set up institutional stablecoin payment rails themselves or devise similar solutions that are cheap and efficient? That's essentially what Facebook has been trying to do with Navi and Dian optimize stablecoins for actual payments rather than for trading crypto assets, it remains to be seen which platforms will be long-term stablecoin winners, but it seems that they will trend towards rather centralized or federated networks to maintain low fees. The goal for many users isn't really decentralization, instead their goal is efficiency with regulatory oversight. Competing base layers or competing second layers. If we put aside the current issues with DeFi's and NFTs and grant for the sake of further analysis that smart contracts have a very large total addressable market besides speculation and besides stablecoins, then a question becomes, who will the winning platforms be? 
there's an interesting narrative competition between Ethereum and Solana and Avalanche and others in the past several months. Ethereum is the established smart contract blockchain with a wide network effect, but with significant scaling problems and very high fees, and hence small retail use are mostly absent other than speculating on the tokens by buying them on centralized exchanges, and is trying to transition from proof of work to proof of stake. Solana is a younger upstart VC-backed smart contract blockchain that comes with impressive scalability, but at the cost of more centralization. Avalanche proposes a complicated solution to trying to address this as well. Then there is Algorand and others. DeFi and NFTs have thus begun to spill out from Ethereum onto these other smart contract blockchains. Many users are willing to sacrifice a bit of security for fees that are orders of magnitude lower. Ethereum's proponents often criticize, rightly, Solana as being too centralized as their key defense for why Ethereum is better than Solana. But that puts Ethereum in a tight spot because Ethereum's proponents then have to criticize Solana as being too centralized while also defending the fact that Ethereum has these centralized attack surfaces and greater complexity compared to Bitcoin. In other words, it has to justify what the right level of partial centralization and partial decentralization is and that it has achieved this sweet spot. As a result, smart contract platforms remain in the midst of a layer one war with each other as they battle for market share. Meanwhile, the Bitcoin network has layers that can bring smart contracts to itself and they keep getting more sophisticated. The Liquid sidechain, which is a federated sidechain that runs on the Bitcoin network, hosts NFTs including art, gaming tokens, stablecoins, and utility tokens. El Salvador announced plans to issue $1 billion of sovereign bonds on the Liquid network. Rootstock runs on the Bitcoin network as well, to bring DeFi and similar types of applications to the ecosystem. The Lightning network also hosts all sorts of proto-applications focusing on peer-to-peer -peer data transmission. These Bitcoin-based smart contract layers are currently much smaller than on Ethereum. This is partly from culture. Bitcoiners tend to be holders, more so than speculators, tend to not want to trade other types of tokens as frequently, etc. But it's also due to network effect and liquidity. Ethereum is still the dominant platform right now for pseudo-decentralized altcoin trading, leveraging NFT speculation and blockchain gaming, even though it is gradually spilling out into cheaper smart contract platforms. It's unclear to me looking five plus years out where this smart contract liquidity will wind up. Will it stay on Ethereum? Will it continue to gravitate towards even more centralized smart contract platforms like Solana and Avalanche and so forth so that we have an increasingly diluted multi-chain smart contract world? Or will speculation subside and the most utilitarian use cases find their way back to layers on top of Bitcoin due to an appreciation of Bitcoin's more solid base layer? Ultimately, it partially depends on what governments want. Smart contract platforms with centralized attack surfaces can only exist at the pleasure of the government. So it comes down to how much regulatory crackdown they get versus how much regulatory approval they get. In a relatively non-hostile environment, smart contract platforms tend towards commoditization, competing based on price rather than quality. Liquidity trends towards whatever is cheap, centralized, and with sufficient critical mass. There are network effects for liquidity, but these are somewhat offset by high fees, which kind of serve as anti-network effects. In a more hostile environment with regulatory crackdowns or other attacks, then the chains that are too centralized are likely to find it impossible to operate, whereas chains that make throughput sacrifices to maintain some degree of decentralization are able to operate to some extent. Liquidity would naturally need to flow towards the one or a small number of chains that are able to operate in that environment. My overall base case is to see a number of smart, smart contract platforms continue to operate in increasingly regulated ways, constantly fighting for market share. Peer to peer without DeFi. When the Bitcoin network was originally created, there were no exchanges. If people wanted to buy or sell Bitcoins, they had to make individual arrangements. There would naturally be some organized meetups to make this easier, and the industry eventually formed centralized exchanges. But at its core, it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology. If you and I meet in person, I can agree to send you a fraction of a Bitcoin from my Bitcoin address to yours in exchange for cash or any other good that you hand to me, and we can do it at a coffee shop. 
For people who prefer to avoid centralized exchanges, there are various peer-to-peer -peer technologies that make this easier than an in-person meetup like that. BISC, HODL HODL, local bitcoins, and Paxful are all various ways to do peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchanges, and each have different trade-offs and don't require external tokens. An escrow multi-sig platform, for example, can serve as an independent third party. Buyers and sellers put in their Bitcoin and they only get released when the payment from the buyer is made. A third party holds the third key of that contract, which ensures the Bitcoins are only released if both parties are happy and can be an arbiter of disputes to accept proof if one of the parties is unhappy before finalizing the transaction. Nigeria cut off crypto trading from its banking system a while ago. They didn't make owning or trading cryptocurrencies illegal. That's very hard to enforce. But instead, they went with a simpler move of severing crypto from any formal connection with their domestic banking system. You can't take Nigerian fiat currency and easily send it to a crypto exchange to buy Bitcoins, in other words. In order to understand the game dynamics of that decision, realize that Nigeria has persistent double-digit inflation and does not want capital flight out of its banking system into a sound money digital currency that its citizens can easily transact with, but also doesn't want to spark unnecessary social unrest by banning since it's very popular and wants its citizen to be able to receive Bitcoin payments from abroad. Because Nigeria has a lot of good programmers and graphic designers that foreigners are happy to hire and pay Bitcoin for with a population of well over 200 million, Nigeria has a little incentive to put resources into going door to door and make sure Nigerians aren't using Bitcoins. But the point is, individual Nigerians needed to find alternative ways to transact with Bitcoins. And despite that, Nigeria has some of the highest adoption of Bitcoin usage, ranked at number six worldwide on a per capita basis. They often use peer-to-peer -peer trading, using Paxful and local Bitcoins to send and receive Bitcoins peer-to-peer. -peer. And they use Telegram groups and other types of coordination to exchange fiat currency for Bitcoin. They don't use DeFi blockchain platforms in mass. DeFi, with its high fees, is mainly for large institutional speculators, arbitrage players, and whales. DeFi thus far is primarily for speculation. When people living in countries with GDP per capita of 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 US dollars are interested in Bitcoins, they don't pay $100 fees on Ethereum to mess around with NFTs or crypto trading or leveraging. They form groups to arrange peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin buys and sales, or they explore the cheapest and often more centralized smart contract platforms. The notable exception to this general observation is gaming. As previously mentioned, Axie Infinity is very popular in the, in the Philippines, but a lot of that involves people grinding to get income from the game and the economics of that only work as long as the game continues to grow. If new player funds don't continually pay out existing players' incomes, then the game is subject to a collapsing user base, unless it's inherently fun enough for most users to invest in heavily, despite no longer getting net income out of it. Protocol or operating system. Ever since Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, countless attempts have been made to improve on his design for the major categories. People debated increasing the block size in exchange for nodes being harder to run, leading to greater centralization, and made new coins based on that. People debated reducing the block times in exchange for less network stability, and made new coins based on that. People chose to sacrifice some degree of auditability for greater privacy, and made new coins based on that. These coins consistently failed to hold even 5% of Bitcoin's market capitalization. The wisdom of the market has decided over rather long periods of time now that it's not interested in them, at least outside of niche circumstances. Meanwhile, the Bitcoin network itself continues to update slowly on the base layer via soft forks, meaning it only makes backward compatible upgrades, and only when there is overwhelming consensus to do so. And it continues to update quickly on second layers, on sidechains, and with hardware and software providers in the surrounding ecosystem that don't affect the base layer. Some of those upgrades can make using the Bitcoin network faster, with more throughput, with more features, and or with more privacy. The big bullet point that the market is still deciding on though is this one. People debated adding more capabilities to blockchains at the base layer in exchange for greater centralization and attack surfaces and made new coins based on that. 
So a big topic that the market is still assessing is whether these partially centralized smart contract platforms that have a big role to play alongside the Bitcoin network, or if they'll eventually stagnate as previous altcoin speculations have. I've seen a number of arguments for what the cryptocurrency field will look like after a long enough timeline. Ultimately, it comes down to whether the space evolves more like protocols do or more like operating systems do. Protocols tend to be winner-take-all outcomes and then hold their position for a very long time with like 90% market share or more. TCP IP is the protocol that the internet runs on and was developed in the 1970s. SMTP is the protocol for email and was developed in the early 80s. Ethernet is the protocol for networking and was developed in the early 1980s. USB is the protocol for interfacing and was developed in the 1990s. In 10 or 20 years, we'll still be running on most or all of these and they upgrade over time. These protocols all had competition initially, but most people today can't name those competitors. Operating systems tend to be oligopoly outcomes rather than winner-take-all outcomes. Multiple operating systems can coexist, each with their own network effect and areas of preference. Only a handful of them can realistically have widespread appeal with critical mass of developer adoption. The same tends to be true for social network platforms as well as financial exchanges. Some people pr propose that after a sufficient maturity of the field, one blockchain will dominate the field with the arguments that they are protocols and one protocol will win, for example, Bitcoin. Other people propose that the outcomes will instead look like operating systems with a small number of persistent large players. Even if one player might have 30, 40, or 50% of the market, it won't have 90 plus percent according to this view. A subset of this argument further proposes that Bitcoin and smart contract platforms like Ethereum aren't even really competing for the same market and thus can be grouped separately with only moderate overlap. I don't have complete conviction on how that will end up. It's clear that Bitcoin won as far as decentralized proof of work blockchain money is concerned. And I think people underestimate the total addressable market size of that concept. Aside from that, will there be persistent large smart contract platform or will they one day fold into Bitcoin as layers on top of it? And to the extent that they remain as independent layer one smart contract platforms, to what extent will they dilute each other and fracture into commoditized, highly centralized, low cost blockchains? The market is still sorting these questions out. Ultimately, my base case between the protocol outcome and the operating system outcome depends on the level of regulatory crackdown. For the protocol outcome, I can envision that smart contract platforms either get hit hard in their attack surfaces, draconian regulatory crackdown, for example, or they crumble under the weight of their circular speculation aspects. Meanwhile, Bitcoin has a decentralized base layer and the ability to build smart contract applications on top of it on other layers, and it can pull that value in over time as other blockchains run into problems. For the operating system outcome, I can envision that Bitcoin retains the dominant marketing share of global money and collateral in the digital asset space with additional layers of complexity built on top of it as well, but that separate large smart contract platforms exist as regulated platforms for cheap stablecoin processing, crypto gaming, altcoin trading, NFT speculation, security settlement, and other applications. These would basically be equity securities. Final thoughts, always consider trade-offs. There are about 15,000 cryptocurrencies in existence as of this writing, as identified by CoinMarketCap. Bitcoin's share of the total cryptocurrency market changes over time. But for example, it currently has about the same share of the market, 40%, now against these 15,000 coins as it did four years ago against only 1,500 coins. So altcoins have mostly diluted each other. The way altcoins market themselves generally is to highlight the shortcomings of Bitcoin as though it were Oltec or Boomercoin, and then explain how they are better than Bitcoin. When you dig into them, it turns out they are making tremendous trade-offs in one area to achieve additional capability elsewhere. They are sacrificing some degree of security, decentralization, auditability, and so forth in order to achieve things like more features, more speed, or more throughput. And now the same thing is happening to Ethereum. Newer smart contract chains offer greater efficiency in exchange for more centralization, 
and criticize Ethereum for not sacrificing more decentralization to scale faster. Satoshi Nakamoto picked his variables very carefully. Each one has been debated and tested. Quote, Governments are good at cutting off the heads of a centrally controlled networks like Napster, but pure P2P networks like Nutella and Tor seem to be holding their own. End quote. Satoshi Nakamoto, November 7th, 2008. When truly better ideas come along for a small part of the protocols after years of proof, Bitcoin developers supported by the users eventually tend to incorporate them into Bitcoin with a consensus soft fork such as the SegWit and Taproot updates. People often think of cryptocurrencies as one big similar asset class, but for the most part, proponents of other blockchains are often the most vocal critics of the Bitcoin network, as they attempt to market their coin over Bitcoins. Meanwhile, Bitcoin enthusiasts are among the crypto ecosystem's largest critics and tend to highlight the scams, hacks, wash sales, and centralization problems that are common among the altcoin cryptocurrency space. Crypto exchanges with numerous coins have an incentive to get you excited about new coins because they make money from trading volumes, even if it's just meme coins like Doge or Shiba Inu with briefly lived spikes. They want to get you in on the action, especially near the top of the spike when enthusiasm is high. Their financial incentive is for their users to hold a large number of coins and trade those coins frequently and are happy to highlight whatever coins happen to be popular at the moment. In that environment, it's the house, i.e. the exchange, that wins either way. To the extent that an investor chooses to speculate in digital assets other than Bitcoins, they should always be able to answer the question, what are the trade-offs for one protocol compared to another before they decide to buy? Overall, I conceptualize Bitcoins as monetary assets and smart contract platform tokens as equity securities. Each person has their own reasoning and penchant for speculation or long-term investing. But make sure you understand what you're getting into when you venture into blockchains other than the Bitcoin network, rather than buying into the marketing without verifying each claim. Okay, well done making it through those two parts. And I don't want to be too long because this has already been a long one and I want to take some time to put my thoughts down into writing and then maybe share them on a thread on Twitter. But I want to start with the point that Lynn Alden finished, which is trade-offs. And yes, for sure, we are in a market where there are trade-offs and buyer beware. You have to know what you're buying. You have to do some research. We're still in the wild west. And so no matter what you're investing in, you have to know what the trade-offs are and what you're actually investing in. The same could be said of Bitcoin with Mt. Gox, you know, back in 2014. And the same is true today. If you put your money in some centralized exchange and something happens, there's risk involved. And so let's just run briefly through the main points because I think this article covered a lot and it kind of bounces around different ideas. It started with, well, this part at least, stable coins as a centralization factor. Then does decentralization matter? Um, and related to that, do tokens matter? And what's the utility for smart contracts and a decentralized ledger? And last but not least, operating systems versus protocols. And when it comes to stablecoins as a centralization factor, the main risk that Lynn Alden is talking about is if there's a hard fork and all of a sudden you find all of the utility for your stablecoins on the fork that you wouldn't have chosen. What would you do? And all of a sudden, all of your stable coins on the version of Ethereum or whatever proof of stake smart contract blockchain you're using, all of a sudden those stable coins are worthless. And the truth is, I don't really think this holds that much water as an argument at this stage of where we are in terms of users on DeFi. And that's for two reasons. And one of them is today, I think most people who are using stable coins are aware of the risks and the counterparty risks of having a centralized counterparty, whether it's USDC or Tether, you know, whatever you're using, all of these parties are risk choke points. We know that this isn't new. The Tether FUD has been out there for years. I hold some USDC and yeah, I'm aware that the US government could crack down and maybe something will happen to that position that I hold. And so I size it accordingly. The same is true if there was a hard fork and all of a sudden it went away 
and then I could choose. The thing about a hard fork, and here's where I'm, I don't think that this argument holds as much water again today with the current users of the blockchain, is that I could just sell those stable coins and port them over to whatever chain I want. Um, and just like when Bitcoin forked into BCH and Bitcoin Cash, I sold my BCH and bought more Bitcoin with it because I wanted the decentralized version, because that's what I wanted to use. That's where the value was. And so if we came to a hard fork like that, I would just sell my USDC on the centralized hard fork and go and port that over to the new Ethereum blockchain, whatever it is. And it was it would be as if I received the dividend. It would be pretty cool. And you know what? Even though the stablecoin money would no longer have value on that new chain because the centralized backers aren't backing it, I'm sure somehow the market would pick up the slack if their users migrated and the users said, this is what matters to us, just like they did with BTC and BCH. And this is why decentralization does matter. And it is important for a use case that's not primarily money. And I agree with Linalden that money is a killer use case for decentralization, for a decentralized ledger, because that's what money is. It's a ledger of accounts and balances and who owes what. But the thing is, there is value for decentralization in protocols and operating systems as well. And today, I think that's actually more kind of obvious than ever before with the control that we have on the web, whether it's Google and Apple in their control of the app stores or Chrome as a web browser. There's just so much centralization and choke points that limits developers that it seems obvious to me that we would care about a world computer, quote unquote, that just runs and that you can power and no one can stop you from doing whatever you're doing. And here I think is where decentralization matters. I don't know if the most, but it's like a killer feature that is really hard to grasp because it's so far from where we are and what we do and kind of the world we live in today. And that is tokenization. And tokenization is so important. It's such a killer feature. And that only comes with a decentralized protocol like Uniswap, SushiSwap, all of, you know, ThorChain between different trains. And the reason why tokenization is so important is that liquidity is everything. And when you tokenize everything and anything, whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's an app usage, Starbucks rewards, airplane miles, gift cards, whatever it is, when you tokenize what we're doing, you add in liquidity and liquidity adds a market and real price discovery. And this is what Balaji Srinivasan calls the DeFi matrix. And I think this concept is really underappreciated because it's hard to imagine because we live in this world of like semi tokenization, right? You have your Starbucks rewards, you have your airplane miles and you use them. And some of us care more and some of us care less. But the thing is those things they're powerful and that's why all of these companies use them but they're not as powerful as they could be because they're not decentralized i have no control over my starbucks rewards and my airplane miles i can't trade them for something else that i actually do care about they can be devalued they can be debased and what tokenization allows and decentralized tokenization allows something where there is no governing authority that can debase and that can control what gets tokenized is the trading and market discovery of all of the different aspects of our lives, whether it's time, work, assets, digital assets, culture, reputation, whatever it is, decentralized tokenization allows for market price discovery on those aspects and trading in real time and liquidity. And that idea is just incredible to think about. And it is what I believe gives a value to a decentralized operating system versus a centralized operating system. And here's a kind of the last point that I want to touch on, which is protocols versus layers. And in a way, I think we've already reached the end game, which is yes, Bitcoin is a protocol. It's a very successful protocol for sound money for, for store of wealth. And that's why it's survived and gained like 90% of the market share for that protocol aspect. Whereas Ethereum, to my mind, is much more of an operating system. 
it enables so much more. And you know it's an operating system because one of the core aspect of its success is, yeah, attracting developers, attracting the ecosystem that builds around it. And that's not to say that ETH shouldn't be a sound money asset, quote unquote, because it should be, especially as the core defense mechanism of a protocol, especially in the scenario where part of the value of the chain wants to hard fork to somewhere else. If the core asset ETH maintains value, then that's the strongest defense mechanism. And that's, I think, part of the reason for EIP-1559 and treating ETH as a sound money asset. It still is, in many ways, an operating system for developers, for apps to be built on top of it, and not necessarily a protocol for value transfer. They're not quite the same things. And in that sense, yes, we have an oligopoly of different operating systems that are vying for those aspects of, you know, the DeFi matrix, the decentralized tokenization aspect. And I don't think that a centralized or semi-centralized blockchain will be the protocol, the base blockchain layer for the decentralized tokenization of everything, because it has to be decentralized. There are use cases for a semi-decentralized blockchain like Solana, whether it's high frequency trading or other financial aspects. But I think the, that key factor of is decentralization important for tokenization, then the answer is yes. Yes, it is. And it's very important. And that's why the Ethereum ecosystem is hellbent on getting that down. Well, I think there's a lot more that I have in mind, but I want to take the time to put my thoughts down properly because I already know that I forgot some things that I wanted to say. But thank you so much for listening up until here. We will be going back to our governance discussion next episode. Until then, thanks so much for listening.